welcome everybody. Thank you for attending the Remembering Marshall program here, uh, May 21st at 10 a.m. in the morning here on a Think Tech webinar. Uh, and this is for our dear Marsha Joyner who passed on April 10th, 2021. And uh, I guess to start, I'd like to, I'd like to play for you guys a, a slideshow that we created out of the photographs you sent us. call you back. <laughs> so I, I want to make some remarks to try to set the tone here, if you don't mind. Um, Marcia was very close to uh, Think Tech. Um, she was not only dedicated to Think Tech, but it was important in her life. Uh, she kept on trucking until uh, after only a, a few weeks before she died. Um, and so uh, take it from me, uh, go on YouTube, type her name in, and you will see an enormous number of videos. She did hundreds of shows for us. And look at her playlists on youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, and you will see all of them, hundreds. It was very important to her. And she's there, and she will be there on Think Tech and on YouTube for a very long time. Um, and you can remember her for years to come. What kind of a person, <clears throat> dedicated, um, determined, friendly with everyone, um, but I want to offer this thought, you know, at least as far as I can see, she's one of those remarkable people who had different relationships with different friends. She never profiled anybody. She never categorized you. Her relationship was with you personally. And that's what made it so nice. I really enjoyed that. There are not many people who, who do that, who are capable of doing that. She treated every single person as special. <clears throat> she had high energy, super creative indefatigable and, and very nostalgic. Uh, she could tell stories from years ago uh, to regale you with fantastic experiences in her life and the life of her families and friends. She got me involved in a number of things, um, you know, with the, her marijuana show that was special. She took me on a tour of the facility there. Um, and I now know much more about marijuana than I did before. Um, she took me, uh, you know, on trips uh, around the palace, and I learned about uh, Native Hawaiian uh, royalty. Um, she took me about uh, trips around the capital, and uh, she knew them all, and they all knew her. It was really something to watch. She was a special person at the capital and at City Hall. Everyone knew her there, too. She took me uh, on a trip 
and we interviewed Ikaika Anderson and others, and it was uh, it was clear that Marsha had a place at, at the uh, at the city hall, and she took me around uh, with uh, John Radcliffe um, to talk about death with dignity. I was there with her when finally, after twenty years, and Scott knows about this. Finally, after twenty years, they passed the thing. Uh, that was a really interesting historical moment, and I was there with her. She took me, and we made a movie of it. So looking back, all the things that um, you know, uh, Marsha gave to ThinkTech and shared with ThinkTech, they were they were gifts. And I come to the conclusion she was the kind of person, not only friendly and 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 and, and personal with you, um, she was giving gifts her whole life, I think. And everyone here is a recipient of those gifts. And so in a way, um, you know, we need to think of her, remember her to, to give back on those gifts. So um, by remembering today, um, that's part of it. And you know how much she would like that. I don't have to tell you. So I would like to uh, extend the, uh, the possibility of comments from people. Um, and some of them are here, some of them may show up later. Uh, but let's start with the ones that I can see and that uh, let's start with Lorna Strand. Lorna, do you have any comments that you'd like to make um, about Marsha Joyner? I'd love to, thank you very much. Um, I met, uh, unlike many of you, I just met Marsha personally two years ago when I became uh, chair of the Oahu County Democrats. And um, she was a force to behold, I could tell from the very beginning. And it didn't take long when she joined me in uh, understanding that what you do is you act. You have to get up and do something if you're going to be a, a member of the party. And she taught me so much. She was the vice chair for House District 18 for the Democratic Party and also very active in our Oahu County Council. Um, she held East, East Honolulu community forums when we were on Zoom and um, was just amazing in terms of helping us raise funds and do all kinds of things. There are a lot of stories which will tell you about her past, including her uh, lifetime struggle for equality and her background in Baltimore, Maryland, with her family owned um, and operated Afro-American newspaper. And she recognized, this is coming from, by the way, a resolution that we passed at the uh, Oahu County, uh, recently on May 1st at the Oahu County Convention. She recognized the struggle for equality and was not an individual endeavor saying, quote, it, civil rights, was always something that was part of my life because the newspaper fought against discrimination for more than 100 years. I think for most African Americans and other minorities, that was always a way of life, the struggle against the whole way of life in America. It wasn't just the South, it was in all of the United States. We declared that whereas Marsha served as the president of the Dr. Martin Luther King Coalition of Hawaii, she was also one of the most original people who fought to make Martin Luther King Jr. Day a holiday in Hawaii. And whereas Marsha Rose Joyner was a pioneer in the civil rights movement and a bold civil rights advocate her entire life. And Marsha dedicated much of her life promoting and supporting the Democratic Party, both here in Hawaii and nationally. And she contributed numerous hours, as we all know, to as a volunteer for countless Democratic candidates and campaigns. Therefore, be it resolved that the Oahu County Democrats of the Democratic Party of Hawaii recognize the legacy of Marsha Rose Joyner as a pioneer in the civil rights movement and be it further resolved that the Oahu County Democrats of the Democratic Party of Hawaii honor the life of Marsha Rose Joyner and acknowledge the impact she has left on the Democratic Party, the state of Hawaii, the United States of America, and I must say, all of our lives. Yeah, thank you, Lorna. You know, just a, one thought, I, you know, I used to ask her all the time what kind of vitamin pills she took. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Daphne Barbie, are you here? Can you give us some thoughts? Aloha, everybody. I would like to start with a quote from Martin Luther King. 
because as you know, Marsha Joyner was on the first Martin Luther King Coalition and the commission. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? So I'll answer that by talking about Marsha Joyner. She did for others and she worked, I think all, I've known her since the 1980s when she had a beauty salon with her husband, Ken, who had a barber salon um, in Waikiki. And when I first met her and I walked into the shop trying to make myself beautiful, uh, there she was sitting in the queen's chair, greeting everybody, greeting me and asking me who I was. I told her I was a lawyer in town, new to town. And then she proceeded to tell me all the black lawyers she knew, proceeded to tell me about the politics in Hawaii, telling me who to watch out for, what to watch out for, uh, and telling me a lot about their business. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, boy, you know, you really do get a lot of information from Barbie, Barber and beauty shops. I mean, you really, whoa, I mean, if you really want to know what's going on, um, talk to Marsha in her beauty salon. Um, I did su uh, submit several photographs for the slideshow. And um, one of the photographs I'd like to talk about um, is Ch Senator Charles Campbell, who is uh, an African-American Senator, he, he's since deceased, but Marsha knew him. That was Naomi anyway, Campbell's husband, yeah? Naomi, Judge Naomi Campbell's husband, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that um, Marsha did is we had um, written articles about him, but he really didn't get a lot of good press. I mean, uh, anyways, Marsha went to, Ann Kobayashi was sitting on the city council at the time, and she said, we need to honor him. And because he started the uh, Open Sunshine Law, and he, not only that, he was the first politician in Hawaii to do sign waving on the corners because one way to get votes was to let people know who you were. And a lot of people who had money were able to do that by buying newspaper ads or magazines ads. So Charles Campbell was the very first person um, politician in Hawaii standing on the street corners with his lay, prominent lay, and asking for people to vote for him. So Marsha went to the city council and got a resolution honoring him a couple of years ago. So some of the photos are of Marsha holding up the resolution that she had in, uh, gotten from the city council. And uh, she was a fighter of all kinds of isms, sexism, racism, homophobia, all sorts of uh, isms, but she was a fighter and she was a doer. The last photo I took of her was two years, well, actually, I'm sorry, it's about four years ago, the Women's March around the Capitol. And there she was, holding her sign and she had to be in her late seventies, holding up the sign and marching and, uh, you know, supporting the women's movement. You know, it was just lovely to be around her. She was such a doer and I will miss her dearly and may she rest in power. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Daphne. Stanley Chang, Stanley, are you here? Morning, Jay. And it's morning, great to okay. see everyone on this call today. Um, yeah, I, it, it's, it's so inspirational hearing all these fantastic words about um, a pillar of the East Honolulu community who I actually first met when I was at the city council um, about 10 years ago. And she has she was working for council member Ikaika Anderson at the time. Um, and, you know, I was actually surprised to learn about her involvement with so many different causes over the years, starting when she first, you know, integrated her high school in Baltimore, Maryland in 1954, um, all the way up to legislative fights like the Death with Dignity Bill, um, because it was not possible to shoehorn her. She wasn't just um, a crusader for one cause. She was so committed to improving our community across the entire spectrum of issues, whether it was, you know, an issue like medical aid and dying, or whether it was uh, community issues. She had me on her think tech show to talk about a new world languages classroom building at New Valley Middle School, which was just as interesting to her. She was just as passionate about as all of the other issues that she was fighting for on a global stage. And I I'll really miss that about her, her passion for um, not just one issue, but all issues um, for so many candidates over the years. Um, you know, people still have this idea that East Honolulu is a bastion of conservatism, but she worked hard for many years. She worked with myself. She worked with people like Representative Mark Hashem 
And one by one, um, East Honolulu started to elect candidates that really saw uh, that really saw eye to eye with her and really fought for her ideals and her principles. And that took a lot of hard work from her. It took organizing rallies. It took reaching out via email. It took um, all kinds of organize, organizational work that didn't get the glory. Um, but that's the kind of hard work that produced the results that today are a huge part of her legacy in the legislature, in the city council, and so on. I was really proud to have been to lucky to know her. I um, admire her, I respect her, and I know that her work lives on through all of us. And so thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you all today and um, rest in power, Marsha Joyner. Yeah, thank you, Stanley. That's all, all touching and, and wonderful. And thank you for being here. So we're gonna take a short break for an Oli. I know that's not conventional, um, but, but I see that Marilyn is here and Marilyn can do this. And Marilyn, can you, can you give us a, an Oli just to, you know, just to bless these proceedings? This is an Oli that I actually did for Marsha that expresses our collective cherished friendship and that acknowledges her ancestors whose path Marsha walked in delving into truth and uplifting humanity. So it goes like this. E ho'olohe, e tu aloha, e puole te aloha na u e malamane, na u ino ino velo akalike ko kupuna, pau na pali pa ika ike ia, Mahalo ya oe no koho aloha, a me kahana mai kai, ike oe ikanani o na kanaka, i aloha mako ya oe, tu upua, pua makamai. And so what it says is, listen dear friend, the flower of friendship, one that we cherish. It is you who delve and seek like your ancestors till the solid cliffs yield their secrets. Mahalo for your friendship and good work. You see only the beauty of people. We love you, our flower, our cherished friend. So I just wanna say first to Marsha, I wanna be just like you. I love the picture that uh, Think Tank sent out because I love your white mu'u, your beautiful lei papali, and the lei pikaki that you wore, tutu vahine and hoa aloha. So I had the privilege of knowing Marsha as a member of the Affirmative Action Committee of the Democratic Party of Hawaii for the Oahu County Committee. Though we had never personally met before, I knew of this woman because of her incredible reputation as a civil rights activist who was passionate and committed to making the world a better place where all people were treated equally preceded her. Motivated and enthusiastic with a smile, Marsha lit up a room when she entered and most especially on her think tank program. She loved the Native Hawaiian people and their culture recognizing that many in the Hawaiian community or Hawaii community would vote in the election of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs this past election, she wanted to assure that voters were informed and thus held the first educational forum on OHA on Think Tank. It was also her way to uplift and support Native Hawaiians. We will really miss Marsha and her very warm smile. So mahalo for this opportunity to honor her today. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn Lay Momikan. Wonderful to have you here. Um, <clears throat> Scott Foster, you you knew you knew Marsha for 20 years plus, maybe, maybe 25. Can you talk about your life experience with her? Where to begin? Uh, I'm from Oklahoma, and I've been in Hawaii for 35 years, and Marsha was the second person I met when I moved to, to Honolulu. And uh, uh, I, uh, I'm a lifelong Democrat. My family helped found the Democratic Party of Oklahoma. So I grew up in 
in uh, a Democratic Party. So when I moved to Hawaii, it was very natural that the first appointment I had was to join the Democratic Party of Hawaii. And of course, I wasn't there five minutes and I met Marsha Joyner. And from there, it's been a roller coaster ride of a lifetime. And uh, uh, Marsha was truly the most amazing, unique individual I ever knew. Uh, her uh, uh, work in civil rights, of course, is renowned. Uh, that's where Marsha and I crossed a lot. I'm, I'm gay and have been openly gay for 50 years. And uh, there was a time one couldn't be gay. And uh, I, I found in Hawaii that one could be openly gay and didn't have to talk about it. They could just be what they were. And uh, so from that point is, is where all of my friends came from, were Marsha Joyner. And uh, uh, oh, the stories, the stories that we could tell, uh, the issues we were able to work on, Death with Dignity, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, I worked for 35 years on that. Marsha kind of joined me a little late into that issue. Uh, but uh, when she was ready to get involved, she surely did and helped us push it over the top. Uh, it took another few years, but we did it. And uh, other issues, gay rights, of course, is one. Uh, the AIDS pandemic was a... a uh, horror story for all of us, and Marcia was very involved in the early years of, of the AIDS battle in, battle in Hawaii. And uh, again, it just goes on and on and on. I will will uh, uh, miss her the rest of my life. I miss her every day now. And uh, I just don't know how many of us will exist without her, but I'm sure with with her consciousness that she exuded uh, we'll continue on. Thank you, Scott. Well, she's here with us today, and we're here with her. But let me let me offer a thought. You know, from the comments so far, it appears that Marcia spelled her last name wrong. It was J O I N E R. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. Okay, <clears throat> let's let's talk to Catherine Takara. Catherine, can you give us your remarks and uh, about your life experience with Marsha? Hi. Hi. I'm honored to be here today, and I'm thrilled to hear the comments and memories that everyone has been sharing. I must have met Marsha in the 70s, and although I was an educator, mainly at the University of Hawaii, um, and I was involved with the public, but I was basically always a word person. So we had parallel um, paths. I wrote the issues that she spoke and that she acted. And so I did write a small thing here and I wanted just to share it. Heroes, I was thinking about heroes. Who are our heroes, our sheroes, living and not near and far? Marsha was a hero, a shero committed to others, to principles, to truth, to seeds of harmony. She was a pioneer in the vanguard in the islands, a leader on her path to peace, a communicator to the public, a descendant of strong ancestors who knowingly and invisibly opened doors and windows for her, to strength and beauty, to colorful fashion that caught the eye. She was a leader, a pillar, to vision and perseverance, to crossing barriers, to overcoming obstacles. Her presence, her presence was calming, even though she was feisty with her boundless energy. She led in her actions with a smile, all engaging, 
extending a hand to those who could help her causes to those whom she helped. Her courage walked with her like a watering. Her goodness, her goodness shadow far flung. Her healing vision and message all embracing, regardless of race, culture, gender, and other separating labels. Her dedication to humanity, to social justice and peace, wafted in the island breezes and endured through winter storms. Her energy rose like the sunrise, inspiring leadership, partnerships, and promoted her path to peace. A hero, my Shiro, her legacy lives on after her leaving. Good. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Catherine. You're so welcome. A, a hero. Uh, let's let's uh, let's hear what John why hey th he's with us today and uh, we so appreciate that John you knew Marsha pretty well and you ran in the same circles in many ways can you talk about your life experience with her I actually I, I should begin by saying that I thought I knew Marsha pretty well <laughs> in, in the sense that and I think for many of us we don't really appreciate how full another person is, and yet they're our friend. You know, we, we think we're close. We think we, we, we know what they're up to. And, and yet we sort of unconsciously put people in pigeonhole. And so Marsha was my activist democratic friend, but one of the most interesting experiences for me have been this past week. And listening to other people talk about her and appreciating what they were saying and, and what it what it meant in, in, in fully, you know, and, and thinking to myself, I wish I knew that <laughs> at the time that, uh, you know, we, we could talk about it. I mean, uh, it was that her uh, celebration of life recently that I learned, for example, that her great grandfather was a slave, but his father was a slave owner. I mean, how, how do you deal with that in terms of, of your family history and, and become much? You know, and, and then I found out that she actually dealt with it. She actually went back and, and researched it and, and discovered it. And, and there was no think tech show about it. I, I wish there was a, a video I could point to now. Uh, I learned that uh, when she was 15 years old, she was an accomplished cellist. And, and who would have known that? You know, she's the lady running around, organizing, making people sing. Uh, Hawaii Aloha and things like that. And I never saw her do, a, you know, give a skill that she had. And yet at, at, uh, there was a picture, there is a, a photograph of her and Joan Crawford with her holding the chalice. And, and apparently she got to play for Joan Crawford. And as the person who was describing this story indicated, if you know anything about Miss Crawford, she was, but before she'd recognize anybody, she was an absolute perfectionist. I mean, she was a very difficult woman. And there she was with Marsha, <laughs> smiling and, and complimenting. You see, I, all of those things make everything so much richer, so much richer when you then put into context what we, what she got me to work on. And that is, she wasn't in Hawaii for very long uh, after uh, or before I became governor. And she was already at the Capitol uh, lobbying and coming to talk to me uh, for on, on Martin Luther King Day. You know, we, we, need a, we need a holiday. What was happening 
was that the United States Congress kept punting the issue so there was no national holiday. So it was up to the various states to uh, recognize Martin Luther King and his accomplishment. And, you know, being in a sense out in the boonies here in Hawaii, it, it, within uh, the politics of it all, was it didn't seem as compelling uh, in a sense. So what the state had done was, uh, you know, do something halfway. We recognized the holiday, but didn't give anybody off time off from work. And, uh, and then Masha came to see me and she started to personalize why that holiday was important. And, you know, and the typical kind of objections that were being heard were, uh, there are many, but basically it was, wow, public workers have too many holidays anyway. You know, why do we need and so forth. But in the course of educating ourselves and with Marsha's help, we ended up uh, trading um, Columbus Day for uh, Martin Luther King Day, which, you know, in hindsight, uh, showed that we were, as usual, Marsha was ahead of her time. <laughs> we probably would have canceled Columbus Day now. You know, I, I don't, I shouldn't be saying things like that, but, you, you know, she was there. And, and now to learn how, how rich she was, you know, I, in closing, I was, well, we worked on so many issues. And, and believe me, we, there's been a lot of participation today by, by Democrats and how important she was to our party. But interestingly enough, before her day of uh, remembrance, I get a call from the one Republican, one, from the Republican members of the House who wanted to make sure that she got a resolution from them. And Re Representative Jean Ward made real clear that, you know, she's my constituent. We may not agree on politics, but we sure worked on a lot of stuff together. And so Marsha was everywhere doing what she felt, you know. I, I was blessed. She blessed me. I, I should have, I don't know if this is a good thing to talk about, but she blessed me with a nickname. So she had a nickname for me. And, and what she used to go and call me was King John. She'd always say King John, you know, King John. And, and ordinarily, you would think that that's a, a you know, a, a um, flattering nickname. But every time I would be in a room of people and there would be a voice somewhere in the back of me saying, King John, my back would actually tingle because I knew that that would be followed up with an assignment. You see, to Marsha, King John was the guy who uh, ran an errand for her, did things for her, you know, and, and it was, uh, it, it was a, a way of letting me know that uh, there ain't no kings left in Hawaii. <laughs> And that was just Marsha's way. So like all of you, um, you know, we, we treasure moments uh, when we look back at it. And so I have many moments that I would treasure with Marsha. But I have to say that, uh, you know, thank you. Thank Marsha for being who she was, but thank all of you for making the Marsha I know so much richer. Aloha. Aloha, John. Thank you so much. It's clear that Marsha was engaging, has engaged, had friends all through our society and had effect and left a mark on all through our society. Uh, let me go to uh, jo Joanna Tachibana. Joanna, can you offer us some remarks about your life experiences with Marsha? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Um, where do we start? Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. And as, as Governor John said, the memorial service 
and it broadened our perspective on um, Marsha and her life. And I was privileged to work with Marsha for two and a half decades. My work with the United Nations uh, is in my background. I have the flag here. And also this calligraphy is love, which represents the heart of things that Marsha and I went through. And um, so many, so many treasured memories. And I'd like to walk one path is that um, you know, she was dedicated as the, the Dr. Martin Luther King one founding members. And in that vein, we would ring the, the peace bell, the Nagasaki peace bell at behind city hall. And um, because of the dedication, the Nagasaki peace committee in Nagasaki, Japan honored Marsha and her comrades to for, for the dedicated work with Nagasaki. And um, together with the United Nations Association, we co-sponsored decades of commemorations for on August 9th, Nagasaki Day. Um, as in Hawaii, we commemorate August 6th, which is the Hiroshima, because that's the first bomb. And uh, we, we kind of neglect and then um, Nagasaki, but we wanted it to be distinctive. And um, historically, you know, Marsha was a historian and she um, said, okay, Hiroshima, August 6th, sister city. Then on August 8th, you know, President Truman signed the declaration to join the United Nations. So 1945, a day of peace, we thought, hooray, hooray, I wasn't there. But then he also authorized August 9th, Nagasaki. And that stirred many, many hearts. And we said, okay, no more nuclear weapons. You know, this has been a travesty. It was the first one that devastated hundreds of thousands of people. So we have annual uh, commitment to do a Nagasaki ceremony. And um, it, it, there was an article in the paper about Marsha. And one of the results of the uh, Nagasaki anti-nuclear is that we, we developed what we call the Sunflower Project. And Sunflower Project, okay. And people love sunflowers because they're bright and yellow. But we discovered that sunflowers also detoxify nuclear waste in the land. And the, it was used at Chernobyl when they ended that crisis and now is currently used in Fukushima by the people, they're planting it so that perhaps they can rededicate the soil to the greater good and greater use. And um, so that, that is our legacy and we work on that. And you know, um, our United Nations Association Hawaii chapter honored, honored Marsha with the Peace Award and the seventh year anniversary of the United Nations a few years ago. And our motto is uniting the world with aloha, which she, she came up with that phrase for us. And that goes on all of our stationery, and that is part of our flags. And um, on a very personal note, um, my husband passed away eight years ago and she helped organize the remembrances, even getting the Royal Hawaiian Trio to to have a prelude program. And then so the Rahawan Band is part of our Nagasaki ceremony every year, you know. So Marsha and I have shared many warm moments, many uh, life experiences. And as you heard that, you know, all these aspects that John, everybody's sharing something and then the rich car, uh, tapestry that she wove integrated all of us as part of her life and her legacy. And, um, you know, I, I said that she is my peace soul sister and I shall miss her dearly, but we carry on the work because she lives in our hearts. And I said that, and then I had the privilege of visiting Marsha a few weeks before she passed away in her daughter's house, which is her, her daughter, Marilyn, was a hospice nurse, so she was there. And when we got the call 
and we, we went there very, very carefully, my friend Ed and I, because we thought hospice, you know, it's close to the end. Maybe we'll have, we'll say hello, drop our flowers off, you know, but no, she is vigorous. There's storytelling. We spent an hour and a half talking story, sharing, loving, and reminiscing on the path we had walked together. And before I left, I, I'm going to do this again. We prayed together, and I'd like to close my portion with the prayer I sang for Marsha. It's a, a love song. E aloha mai i a'u. E aloha kaku apau. E pili mai pu'u vai kaku. Aloha maluhia no kahi. Aloha maluhia no kahi. Ahui ho, Marsha, until we meet again and continue our work in heaven. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. That's, that's beautiful and elegant. And I actually did not know about all her global activities the causes that we all knew. She embraced every cause you could think of here in Hawaii, but she was on, on a global scale also. And that's very interesting to know. With each speaker, we learn more yes. about Marsha. I want to uh, take a moment and just say there's some interesting comments on the chat, <clears throat> if you haven't seen it. Uh, one of them, uh, this is for you, uh, Daphne. I quote, I really like Barbie. <laughs> Who said that? Ken, Ken Farms said that. Oh, hi, Ken. Ken is great. He, he was at her uh, celebration of life, and he's a very yeah. good person. And he was a close friend of uh, Marcia's. Oh, yeah. And um, Marianne Ambrose uh, said to the panelists, uh, Marcia took me around the Capitol. She did that for me, too, I think. Um, and uh, then there's one from, uh, I can't, oh, I guess it's also from Marianne. Thank you, Marsha and ThinkTech, for the, the book interview, Underwater Acts of Kindness. Um, that's very nice. And, and then there's a note from Andrea Josiah. Kenneth Joyner is watching. Um, and I guess, I guess the last one um, that is very interesting is from our host, uh, uh, a longtime host, Cynthia Sinclair, who knew Marsha well. And she says, Jay, wonderful service. I am in tears throughout. Isn't that nice? Andrea Josiah to the panelists and attendees, beautiful tribute, double exclamation, and Ken Farm, ha ha, how are you? Rest in power. Perfect to describe Marsha, <laughs> rest in power. <laughs> okay, let's move on down our uh, pipeline here. Um, so we have, uh, next is Gary Kubota. You know, I met Marsha through the, International Peace Bone Project and the Dr. Martin Luther King uh, statewide awards. awards. Uh, these, these focus on students and poetry, teaching poetry, poetry about nonviolence and peace. And um, but one of the things that I also we also mutually had was history in terms of uh, civil rights and organizing against well organizing people specifically in Hawaii my work at fighting evictions successfully in the 1970s. So we started talking and, and one, one day Marsha mentioned how for more than a year and a half, probably more than two years, the, the African-American position of ethnic studies had not been filled. And this was at the time when the uh, University of Hawaii was trying to woo uh, President Obama's to bring his library to Hawaii. And uh, I just felt it was, you know, like her, really outrageous. And so we worked together and she put together a, a panel uh, on public te the, the public cable television. Um, and I invited Lee Waidu, um, and former councilman and representative of the Sun Yat Sen Association, Larry Kamakaviva Ole, who was the former Kukua Hawaii member uh, and a, a, a lawyer. And um, Buddy Aku was from the Windward Side, and we had we had a panel uh, and a panel discussion. It was very effective, um, and we met, let let the administration know about this. And uh, three months later, uh, within three months later, there was an announcement that they were going to fill the position. 
So, you know, it's hard to say just what makes people decide, but if they had it, we would have already organized the core of a protest. And I think Marcia understood that. <laughs> and so did they probably, because uh, we occupied the University of Hawaii administration building um, about 50 years ago in order to preserve ethnic studies to continue it. Uh, I just wanted to thank Marcia for, for being there when, when people really needed it. Uh, I wanted to introduce my, my wife, who's actually the coordinator who worked with Marcia for more than 20 years on the statewide uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Peace Poetry Contest. M Melinda Gaughan, and maybe she can say a few words. Aloha, I'm Melinda Gaughan, and I am the coordinator of the International Peace Poem Project, and we're creating the world's longest poem on peace. And 22 years ago, we decided to begin a outreach to all the schools, public and private, inviting every teacher to have their children submit poetry on peace and nonviolence in, in honor of Dr. King. And I wanna draw your attention to our banner behind us. So 22 years ago, when we were holding our very first Dr. King Awards, um, and they were gonna be statewide, we had a tiny new project, all volunteer. And one of our directors, our, my, my co-poet, Frank Rich, who's a wonderful, wonderful writer, knew Marsha and ran into her in Oahu and shared with her our project. And she said, oh, and she said, have Melinda contact me. We have to get this to the mayor's office. The mayor has to be involved. And so Frank contacted me and I contacted Marsha and she assisted us that very first year in bringing our winners to Jeremy Harris's office to be honored by the mayor. And he had issued certificates of honor for our little winners. And he had blocked out 15 minutes of his schedule. And Marcia used to love to tell this story because she said that there she was and he looked out the window and there were our 50 little winners and their family all dressed up with lays and aloha wear. And he canceled the afternoon. And he spent the entire afternoon with Marcia and with Frank Rich uh, welcoming and congratulating each little family and each little winner. And every year thereafter, we celebrated at the Honolulu Hale and then at the Mission Memorial Auditorium. And Marcia was always there with us to celebrate each child. She believed that it might be the only time a person was ever honored. And she really helped me to learn to really recognize the importance of each little poet. And I have kept that lesson in my heart all these years. She thought that our work in educating the students and having the teachers in the schools teach about peace and nonviolence in honor of Dr. King was of the first importance, she said. And she continued to work with us every year um, and was present at all the Oahu Awards. And I was able to raise funds, we're all volunteer, to bring her to Molokai, she was so excited when Molokai was big enough and we had the first awards there. Oh my goodness, it was just marvelous. And the officials were there, Linda Coyton, Colleen Machado, and oh, a number of people were there to celebrate our kids with Marsha and she was overjoyed. Um, she really believed that there was something important in every child's heart and that we had an opportunity to awaken them to the importance of peace. She stayed with us in our home here in Maui and was a guest of honor at our Maui Awards. We also went to the Big Island together and she was able to see Billy Kanoe and she was so happy to see him, particularly before his death. And she was instrumental with me in sending him um, special pictures and, and our commemorative prize to be sure that he knew how much his, his presence meant to her. So we're, we're just so honored and so delighted to be included in this forum of thanks for, for Marsha. I shall miss her dearly. I, I don't know how we'll do the awards without her, but we will, and she'll be smiling at us. And I thank you all. She would be there and she would send her heart to each and every one of you. And we thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Melinda. Um, it's, it's wonderful to hear these stories. And, and I have a, a chat message, if you haven't seen it, from Sequoia Carr Brown to all the panelists. She says, uh, I love all of these wonderful stories about Marsha. I only knew of Marsha through mentors and her fabulously fashionable appearance 
at a Black Futures event. Rest in power, lovely lady. <laughs> that was while you were speaking, okay? Let's go on to Sharon Yarbrough. We here at Think Tech, we all know Sharon Yarbrough. She is uh, integrated into the fabric of Think Tech, and she has been doing shows for a long time. Uh, Sharon, can you talk about your life experience? And I know it's a deep life experience uh, with Marsha Rose Joyner. Yes, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. I, I just, I, I love Marsha. Love, love, love Marsha. Uh, she, she and Ken, who is, Ken is on the line, is his daughter, Angeria Josiah. They are on the line now. They were at our wedding um, almost, you know, 25, almost 30 years ago. What I'm going to do is, um, I'm, we were at the governor and I and Daphne. Uh, we were at Marsha's celebrating uh, the life of Marsha. So I'm going to read what I, what I read at her memorial. And it's entitled, Love Never Dies. One of God's most precious creations, Marsha Rose Joyner, who was blessed with the gift of sharing her love with whoever she met and that love never dies. The physical part, the shell that everyone sees is the present and past. And it is shown through memories, recordings, books, videos, and all of our photographs. When one contemplates the way life used to be, we see Queen Marsha and think of good times we shared. All of us can think of good times that we have shared and the joys she had for us. None of us thought we had to say goodbye because times before you were always there. Now time has passed on and now you are gone. Though it is hard, we will carry on. Love never dies. Because we knew your laughter, your smile, your listening ear will remain here in all of our hearts. To ease away the pain, we think of your advice we have gained. We will miss you. And so we have all learned to smile again because Dear Queen Marsha, love never dies. Sometimes we catch ourselves talking to you as if we were, you were standing there. Many times we have shed tears because Queen Marsha, you are so very special to us. Living in our memories, giving our souls wings to fly. While it is true, we all have to grieve. We know in our hearts, we will meet again because love never dies. Your laughter, in everything we do, we can't help but think of you, the energy that pulls us through, love never dies. And though you're gone, your laughter, your love leads us on our healing way, and your smile remains in our minds day by day. Queen Marcia, we all miss you so feeling sad and blue, and we all have to do is think of you and the shining light you have given us will pull us through. Love never dies. With open arms and open door, there was never a stranger in your home. So Marsha Rose Joyner right now and forevermore, you would not be alone for love never dies. And this is from my husband, Herman N. Yarbrough III and Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. Marsha, we love you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That's beautiful. I, I think I will always remember that phrase, love never dies. Thank you. Okay, it's time to open it up to the attendees beyond the panelists. So if they are interested in talking about Marsha, let them raise their hands. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me in. I uh, was a long, long time friend of Marsha's and among the many, but I wanted to focus one particular thing about her. I loved the phrase, love never dies. Her passion and obsession was partly with history, but it was with living history. It wasn't with any like, uh, you know, compartmentalized past. Literally, she dealt with you know living history walking history street theater and so on i i had been friends with marcia had a nice relationship with her it's like you know 
she had interesting stories about being in SNCC and civil rights. And But the day came, she called me up and said, our dear mutual friend, Glenn Grant, who most of you remember, Glenn has died. And now Kaufman, Tom, she would never say Kaufman, she said Tom, you are the, my go-to person for history. And you have to realize that, you have to accept that. And whenever I want to talk to somebody about history, and I'm going to call you up and we're going to talk and we're going to get together. And uh, she did so. And she, we had many conversations about history, uh, which were very much in the vein of living history. One of them was about the queen. She was, she often thought about the queen and drew parallels between the queen's nonviolent response to the overthrow and the, not the central importance of nonviolence to uh, the civil rights movement. She seized on the masthead Keloha Aina, um, which was the leading among several newspapers, um, uh, resisted the overthrow, resisted the annexation, and was the the voice of the Navahi family, uh, Joseph Navahi and his wife, Emma Navahi, way up through the war into like 1947. She took a hold of the masthead of Kealoha Aina and did a whole historical edition of Kealoha Aina, delineating the transition from the annexation as it was called, and the anti-annexation movement and the uh, evolution into the Home Rule Party and then the links to the Democratic Party. And it was absolutely pathfinding in its uh, historical development, but it was also ingenious way of weaving different histories together, right? And that was her, uh, I think her, uh, you know, finest contribution. Uh, one time we did a living history project on the steps of the, on the palace. And it was about the Bogus Khan uh, convention, constitutional convention that was held by the white provisional government and the way they had packed um, the delegation to write this tremendously racist, reactionary, literally Mississippi uh, constitution for the so-called Republic of Hawaii. Marsha grabbed this story and brought it to life. And it was very chaotic as a lot of the, uh, of the living history projects are because they have got a different people acting different parts and so on and so on. And I think, God, this, this is, um, part, I jumped the gun on my part. And Marcia said, Tom, Tom. And I thought, oh God, I screwed up. So I had this whole sense of this, this thing is a, is a, is a mad jumble. But Marcia just hung in there with it and hung in there with the whole audience. And... At you know, end. Tom, I, I was there. You were there. I was, I I was there. there. I remember seeing you there. Yeah. Your, your book was the centerpiece of that, uh, that historical program in front of the Atlantic Palace. Oh, yeah, no, and but... uh, Marcia, Marcia insisted yeah. that, that, I, that I be part of the play. She yeah. wanted me to be this racist judge. Okay. <laughs> and I, I, I felt bad about that because I'm not a racist judge. Um, and I rather, you know, sympathize with the other players she had there. But it got worse because one of the other players in this little play, another racist person back in what, 1894, wasn't it? Or 1895? 1895. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the other players failed to show up that day. And Marcia said, no, you have to play him too. So now I have played two 
racist people in this yeah. play. And, you know, there were two or 300 Native Hawaiians out there um, among the palm trees on the way to the bandstand in front of Ilani Palace who were really emotionally involved in this. And they were and looking at more me more. as I was a symbol of all <laughs> that had brought the kingdom down. <laughs> it got more, anyway, and more emotional as it went on, despite it was this very, very emotional. Sort of chaotic thing. And at the end, remember, Jay, remember at the end, she said, all of those who want to stand, I think it was probably like, who want to stand with the queen, come up the palace steps. And everybody flocked up to the palace steps and stood with the queen. And it was... It was really... Total. Really life. fabulous. Okay. Uh, thank you very much so, for love coming of, around. Love of living history. Living yeah. history. And Marsha was certainly absolutely into that. Okay. Let me ask if there's any other attendee who would like to speak. Uh, okay, there is somebody. Uh, Gwen, can you come on? Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Glenn Joyner. I am the son of Kenneth Joyner, uh, Marsha's husband, and uh, Marsha's, that makes me Marsha's stepson. Um, and Jay was able to make it. I was able to get my flight squared away, so really happy I was able to, to be here. Yeah, I called the airline for you. Thanks so much. You, you, you're a man of much power. I can see that. <laughs> and this is my wife, um, Antonella. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, it's really lovely, wonderful to have so many people sharing uh, their stories about Marsha. And I, many of you were at her memorial service a couple of nights ago. So um, thank you so much for um, all your contributions. Um, but on behalf of our family, I just wanted to say, you know, Marsha lived a life that can only be called inspirational. I mean, she certainly was an inspiration to me. Um, you know, unlike many working stiffs, she managed to dedicate her life to doing what she, what she loved, the things that she was really passionate about. And that was helping underserved and underrepresented peoples from African-Americans to Native Hawaiians to um, other Pacific Island peoples like Micronesians to the LGBTQ community. And she lived her life to the fullest. Um, when she was done, she really left nothing on the table. Uh, her bucket list was complete. Um, and I don't think any of us knew, like uh, King John said, I don't think any of us knew just how much she did for so many people, just how, how big her uh, sphere was um, and the influence she wielded um, at the highest levels of democratic politics. You know, much like uh, MLK, she definitely threaded the needle between social activism and political power. Um, and perhaps her greatest skill was, as they say in Texas, getting SHIT done. She really knew how to get shit done. Um, the most senior leaders in politics came to her for precisely that reason. Um, she just knew how to get things done. Um, when leaders made promises, they came uh, to Marsha to, to help execute them. But it was never clear who was actually uh, in charge. Was it the leaders? Was it the governors? Like um, the senators, like uh, Senator Stanley Chang? Governor Waihe, U.S. Senator Brian Schatz, or, or was it Marsha? I mean, it was never really clear. Um, and when an event was done, when it was finished, you know, she would come home to my father and he would ask her, you know, so how did it go? And she would modestly respond, good. Because of that self-effacing quality, um, I don't know that any of us knew the full scope and panorama of all she managed to accomplish. When she passed, all the news stories came out chronicling all her achievements and all the people came forward as today and in the memorial services saying all the things, wonderful things that she did. So we really began to understand the giant that she was and the um, amazing, uh, gigantic life that she led. Everything came into focus only at that point. But I wanted to end with one story that kind of, um, encapsulates the uh, charm and the attractiveness she had, how she was able to get people to do things for her, even strangers. Um, at my father's 55th birthday party, um, way back in the mid eighties, um, she, Marsha, I was her accomplice, accomplice in planning that. 
she wanted to get something special for my dad. So she went to a boutique in Waikiki. My dad's birthday is in February, February 2nd. And she went shopping and she saw something that caught her eye. It was a pink uh, sports coat, a pink blazer. And she thought this would look great, you know, uh, on Ken. But she wasn't sure about the size. So she picked it up and there happened to be an African-American man standing next to her. And um, she says, I'm not sure if this is going to fit him. And so he heard her and she said, well, okay, well, maybe I can help. How tall is your husband? She said, he's about your height. Oh, okay. Well, how, how big is he? I mean, he's about your size. And she says, okay, well, why don't I just try it on for you? And she goes, oh, that would be wonderful. So he tries it on, models it, looks great on him. So she decided to buy it. And... And she said, oh, by the way, my name is Marsha Joyner. Um, thank you so much. He goes, yeah, my name is Walter, Walter Payton. Walter Payton, the great Walter Payton, also known as Sweetness, the highest honor in the NFL is named after him, the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. So that is the way, you know, and Marsha didn't know who she was. She said, oh, thanks, Walter. We'll see you around. And when my father um, heard that story, Marsha told my father the story, he was, he loved the, the story even more than the jacket. So that's kind of effect that Marsha had on people. She was so attractive, charming, and inspirational. So that's- <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. What a wonderful story. So many, so many memorable stories that we will not forget, nor will we forget Marsha. So uh, we have, we have uh, Eric Gill would like to offer a short uh, uh, remark and a uh, short comment. I've learned a lot about the many, many things Marsha did uh, by listening to this, and um, I, I can't add more stories to what I've seen. I, I wanted to just express my my my, my gratefulness to Marsha. You know, Marsha revered my revered my dad um, because of his uh, role in passing the sixty four Civil Rights uh, Amendment in Congress in his one term there. And I learned more from Marsha about what my dad did than I knew from any other source. And she, she transferred that to me. And, you know, she always was supportive. I've been through many trials and tribulations and, and at every turn, Marsha was supportive. She would, she would call me up and just let me know how that she was proud of me and that she thought my dad would be proud of me. She was sending me flowers, you know, on the text and all I can say is uh, one of the best things I've ever been called is when I went on her program on Think Tech and she introduced me as her dear friend. Just wanted to say that to everybody. I'm going to miss her. Thank you. I'd like to read a piece we got from Sharon Nakashima on the chat, if you haven't seen it. <clears throat> Sharon says, thank you so very much. This is beautiful and touching, a celebration of a legendary peace leader, gracious in her beauty, fierce in her spirit, and with her kindness. And aloha. Aloha of one who has dedicated and fought valiantly for peace and nonviolence. Marsha is inspiring. You can count on all of us to carry on your peace legacy, to care for the community. Your peace work will live always. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, we have Deborah Butler. First of all, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Um, Marsha and I used to fellowship a lot when we would see one another out in passing and at the Zeta Phi Beta functions as long as well as the um, democratic events. Marsha inspired me because she was a mover and a shaker. She knew how to make things happen. She used all her gifts and she used all her talent. And that's what she would want for us. She would want for us to use our gifts and our talent. And I want you to imagine if you will, imagine being on your deathbed and in most cases when we imagine this we see our families and we see our loved ones standing around 
our deathbed, saddened by our dying. But that's not what I want you to visualize this time. I want you to imagine standing around your deathbed or all of your dreams that you're not using, all of your ideas, all of your talents, and all of your God-given gifts, all of your books, all of your sermons, all of your skills and goals that God has given you in life that you never developed, that you never nurtured, that you never did anything with. Just imagine them all standing around your deathbed looking at you with large angry eyes and large frowns of disappointment saying, God gave us to you and now we must die with you forever because you never done anything with us. You never used any of the gifts, any of the talents that God gave you. All you did was just sat on us and procrastinated about us and you kept us all to yourself. So the question is, if you die today or tomorrow, what dreams will die with you? What ideas will die with you? What talents will die with you? What abilities and skills and books and sermons and seminars and businesses and songs and poetry will die with you? This uh, Miles Monroe, may he rest in peace, said the wealthiest place on the planet is the cemetery. He said it's not in the Far East where they have oil in the ground and it's not in South Africa where they have diamond uh, mines. He said the wealthiest place on the earth is the cemetery. He said because there you'll find dreams not lived, books never written, songs never sung, sermons never delivered, businesses never erupted, talents never nurtured, skills never developed, degrees never pursued. Don't wait too late to be the master of your fate. And I say to you today, don't wait too late to be the captain of your soul because the next minute is not promised to any of us. And just as Ms. Marsha used all of her talents and she used all of her skills and all of the gifts that God blessed her with, we too shall pick up the baton and use our gifts and talents and skills. Use them now while the blood it's still running warm in our veins. Thank, Thank you, you Deborah. Deborah, we, we have five more people waiting, so I want to uh, give them a little time before we run out of time. But Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Powerful. But let's go to the five people who are waiting, and if they could please hold their comments down to about a minute, that would be helpful so we can finish on time. Okay, who's first? I think a lot has been said already about uh, Marsha. One of the things I think that cannot be stressed enough was, you know, her ability to make the judgment call of when to push, when to pull, when it came to the messages or, or convincing people, even in the legislature, about certain things. And she was very good at that, something that I, I will miss dearly as a friend, but also something that I learned. Uh, the other thing, too, is uh, the ability to what I call voluntold people about doing things early in the morning on the phone hey, I need you to do this for me. She's always with that. So, I mean, that's something I will definitely remember. Um, and I do like what you said in the beginning about uh, we will call you back because, you know, that was her message on the phone. I will call you back. So I'll keep it short. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, Ken. That's great. I, I just want to share a little bit about my, my connection with Marsha. You, you know, I, I, I can't remember when I met her. It seems like I knew her all my life. And we worked together on the restoration of the Gandhi statue. Uh, I remember in 2015, uh, after we had performed, my wife and I uh, and our group performed for that celebration of Gandhi Day, I, I stepped back and, and looked at the sculpture and I realized that it was so dark. I'm, I'm a sculptor. Um, and I realized that I could change the patina and make it visible to everyone. Um, and um, Marsha just saw that and, and went together with me and my wife and we created the Friends of the Gandhi statue in Waikiki and, and we did it. We, we raised the money. She was so crucial in helping us raise the money to, to do that restoration work. And a part of that was my finding the, the original artist 
who is part Shawnee, and I and I connected with him, got permission to change the patina and create it. You know, it was so dark, no one could see it. We we accomplished that, and and she brought to my attention someone who I did not know, but have since learned so much about, Hung Wai Ching, and um, we we got together, and and she inspired me to come on board to, to do a sculpture of Hung Wai Ching and connect and do a proposal to the family and the, the Ohana of Hung Wai Ching. And so um, I'm hoping that that comes to fruition and we'll certainly dedicate that to Marsha if, if, if it does. Thank you, Kim. Kim Dufay, really appreciate it. Very interesting how many people Marsha knew in the community, everyone. Cynthia, one of our hosts, our long-term hosts, who, who sent such a nice note in a few minutes ago. I, um, I want to, to just say how, how touched I was by everyone's tributes and songs and poems and olies and just, it was just beautiful. And I've been in tears throughout. I remember how she would come up to me. So I know she's done all these big things but she changed my life in just a small but gigantic way. With Cannabis Chronicles, I've struggled with um, autoimmune disease for 30 years and I've had to hide in the corners to use medical marijuana. Um, and, and it was such a, still even now a touchy subject and, and a controversial issue. And her Cannabis Chronicles really changed my life. And she told me I didn't have to hide anymore. And, and she took away a bunch of shame from me. And that was just an empowering moment that changed my life. So she pestered me for a year to come on her show after I first got my show. And then <laughs> when I finally did, we were fast friends ever since. And I'm grateful, grateful to Jay for this, this um, time today. Kisses to you, Cynthia, as always. Uh, who's next? I would like to say that uh, I was there at the signing of uh, Governor uh, Ige when he signed the Our Care, Our Choice Act, and that's Senate Bill 839, and that was in the latter part of 2018. And that was very, very forceful, very impactful for the Kapuna Caucus, in which I am a member and of course, Marsha was very strong in that because she was also there as well. Uh, in addition, my memories of her was fairly recent. I guess it was a 2020 uh, March of the uh, Martin Luther King Day uh, parade and unity uh, rally. She was active in the Democratic Party. I've seen her in many of meetings. She'd come up to me and and tell me, make sure, make sure that we're represented at the Martin Luther Day Parade. So I really took that at heart, and uh, we were represented. Uh, in addition, uh, we were at the uh, Unity uh, Unity Rally, but it was very important to me that she did approach me and wanting to make sure that we were represented. Uh, Marsha, as well as the other one in civil rights that we've lost, which is Faye Kennedy, uh, very, very strong in civil rights and made a big impact on my family, as well as my daughter, with several of uh, galas and events that we've attended. So thank you, Melody. We're, we're almost out of time. Okay. We have one more speaker. Thank, thank you so you much for, for being here and for those remarks. It, expands our knowledge of what Marsha was doing. And it would take a long time to learn everything that she was doing. <laughs> okay, we have our last our last speaker uh, from, from the attendee group. Uh, I'm here with my father, Kenneth, and I'm actually standing in Marsha's garden. And I've known Marsha since I was 16 years old. She's been married to my father for over 35 years, but until I started planning her memorial service. I discovered that I really did not know her at all. But I just wanted to thank be on behalf of the family and reiterate what my brother Glenn said is thank you so much for sharing your love and your tributes. It's been just a tremendous, tremendous 
uh, feeling of, of expression and gratitude. And um, Marsha, I believe, showed her love with so many people by sending them texts of flowers. So I'm mean, here in her garden. I don't know if you can see the beautiful white orchids that have bloomed since her passing. And I just wanted to share that with all of you and just reiterate my appreciation and gratitude from the family. She was such a big, had such a big life and a big personality that none of us truly knew everything about her, but she will live on and leave her legacy with so many in the islands and worldwide. So again, thank you, mahalo. We love you for everything that you've done for, our, for us and our family. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you, Andrea. Um, it's wonderful to see Marsha's garden. That, that's a that's a great a great closing uh, image for us. So thank you everyone for coming today for remembering Marsha. Don't forget you're remembering it. It isn't done yet. Keep on remembering and keeping on keep on looking at all her hundreds of talk shows and literally thousands of guests on thinktechaway.com and youtubecom thinktechaway. That's what she would want of you. And before I say aloha, I just want to say that I've. I've listened to uh, all these great speakers and great testimonials and great memories, but nobody has actually answered the question of what kind of vitamin pill uh, Marsha was taking. And then I realized, just integrating all of that, I realized that Marsha herself was the vitamin pill. So nutritious for her and for all of us. Aloha to you all. Aloha to you, Marsha, of course. Kisses from all of us. Aloha.